Hello, my name is Charles M. Province. My friends call me Mike. I am the founder and president of the General George S. Patton Jr. Historical Society. The society was begun in 1970. The initial purpose when I started the society was simply to honor the man who, in my honest opinion, never did receive a great amount of attention at the time that he really wanted it. Yes, I know everybody said he was a megalomaniac and he was a prima donna, but in fact, he probably deserved all of that because he was such a great man. He was not just a general. At any other point in time, three or four or five hundred years back in history, he would probably have been one of the great men in all of history. Patton was a man of rather contradictory characteristics, as a matter of fact. He was a noted horseman, a polo player. He was a well-known champion swordsman. He was even in the 1912 Olympics, and during the Olympics he had given the French champion the only defeat that he had received. He was a competent sailor, a sportsman. He was an amateur poet. Uh, some years ago, there was a fellow came out with a book uh, just specifically on Patton and his poetry. He was unpredictable in his actions, but he was always dependable. You knew that he was going to do what he was told to do, and he would do it right. He was outgoing, yet at times he was introverted. History proves him to be one of the most complex and possibly paradoxical figures ever to exist. He's mostly remembered for his unique brand of leadership. It was a role that he cultivated and fully exercised. Very often his daughters would catch him in the bathroom in front of the mirror and he would be giving strange faces to himself and they would say, Daddy, what are you doing? And he'd say, I'm practicing my war face. So when I go to war, I want those sons of bitches to be scared of me, by God. He managed to obtain a supreme effort from his men because he knew what it was like to be in battle. He knew what it was like to be in danger. He was scared himself, and he knew that going into battle was one of the most frightening things you could do. Not only are you in a foreign country, not only are you possibly tired and hungry, you haven't had sleep, and people are trying to shoot you too. He had had the same problems in World War I. He had been in a ditch and he just happened to look up into the sky and in the clouds he thought that he had seen or he said he had seen whichever way you want to take it he said he had seen the figures of his forebears and they were looking down on him and they were shamefully looking at him saying Georgie Georgie there you are lying down in that ditch and you're going to die like a cowardly son of a bitch why don't you get up and at least die like a brave man and he said he stopped shaking and he shook it off and that was it and then he went on and of course he won the battle that day that's what it's all about it's not necessarily being afraid in battle it's being able to control your fear and that's what life is all about life from the time you're born until the time you die life is just one constant battle and if you give in then you're lost if you give in to the fear, then you're lost. What you have to do is constantly stand up and fight back. All of this pretty much was built into him a little bit earlier. Benjamin Davis Wilson was General Patton's great-grandfather. Benjamin Davis Wilson was also called by the Mexicans in early California, Don Benito. Benjamin Davis Wilson was a trapper who had left Tennessee, worked his way over to California. He was a mountain man, he was a trapper, he had uh, fought bears and all sorts of things. It was, if you look at some of the old stories about Davy Crockett, well, Benjamin Davis Wilson was the type of Davy Crockett, if not more so. It was he, not President Wilson, after whom Mountain Wilson in California was named, it was Benjamin Davis Wilson who actually created the citrus industry, the orange industry in California. He built the Episcopal Church of Our Savior in San Gabriel before it was San Gabriel. It was the same church where George S. Patton, after being born, was taken in and baptized. The same church where today there is a stained glass window to honor General George S. Patton. There is a eight foot or nine foot bronze statue of General George S. Patton. Also in the graveyard next to the church, there's the monument to Don Benito Wilson. There's also the graves of General Patton's father, George Patton.
his mother and his aunt and his sister. George Patton was actually called George Patton Jr., but in fact he was the third in the line. But because of the Civil War and things that happened there, there was a break in the line, so he was called the second, or a junior. The Pattons actually uh, regard themselves, regarded themselves as genteel Virginians. Their lineage, they say, was traced back to George Washington and beyond that to a king of England and a king of France. Reportedly, the Pattons were supposed to have had at least 16 signers of the England's Magna Carta that were somehow related to them. After the Civil War, George's father, being a young man, realized that there was very little, if anything, left for them down there. So he packed up and moved to California. And when he moved to California, he met the daughter of Don Benito Wilson, Benjamin Davis Wilson. And they got married, and their son was George S. Patton, Jr. And from that time on, the father taught the son how to ride, taught him how to fish, taught him how to do everything that a man should know how to do. And he learned how to be a man. One of the problems, again, like I said, was uh, General Patton, they think now, suffered from dyslexia. And because of that fact, General Patton didn't go to school until he was about 11 or 12 years old. He stayed at home, and his father and mother read to him. They read from the Bible. They read from the classics. They read from uh, Virgil and uh, Homer and all of the great cla classics about history and Greek warfare and Spartans and all sorts of things like that. And what happened was, all of this stuck in his head. And then when he did go to school at Stephen Cutter Clark School, which was in Pasadena at the time, it was quite interesting to see this young man, about 12 years old, standing up in front of the class who could neither read nor write, even though his classmates could read or write, yet he could stand up there and he could spout volumes from the Bible. He could spout volumes from uh, Virgil. He could spout volumes from Shakespeare. He would do it with great dramatic flair too. Even at 12 years old he was quite the actor. After going to Pasadena General Patton went to the Virginia Mil Military Institute and now at VMI he only spent one year there and the reason he only spent one year there was because his father was in the background and he was working feverishly with the California senators and representatives trying to secure a place for George Patton at West Point. And it took him about a year to do so. But finally, when it happened, he had spent a year at VMI, so he knew what it was like to be a plebe. Actually, Patton probably had about three years of being a plebe, which is pretty rough. He was at, West, uh, he was at VMI for a year, and then he went to West Point. And the first year as a plebe was really rough for him. He had a lot of trouble getting into the track. And because of his reading disabilities, he had major problems there, too. Yet, the interesting thing about all this is that he persevered, no matter what. He knew that he had to do this, so he kept up until he did it. After the year was over, he had failed his mathematics exam by one-tenth of one percent. Now, why this is, I don't know, and I've never been able to track it down, but there is the story that for some reason if you failed a certain exam then for some other reason you had to take another exam and although he had previously passed his French exams he had to take them again because he had failed the other exams so he went back for the French exams and he again failed that one by just about a tenth of a percent and they were going to kick him out but he went forward and he asked them for special permission and because he was such a military type individual they decided to give him a second chance so the following year he came back to West Point again as a plebe now you can imagine that now you're at West Point and all of the people who you were with the previous year are one grade ahead of you and all the people you're with this year know that so you have to work even harder so anyway it took him about five years to get through West Point but once he got through then he did graduate and he was West Pointer and he was on his way. After West Point, 
at which he graduated 46th in the class of 103, which isn't too bad for a person with dyslexia. He had actually held the rank of cadet corporal, sergeant major, and the adjutant of his class. He won his school letter by breaking a school record in the hurdles event. He had tried to break records and to play football and baseball, but when he was playing football, he broke his nose twice. He broke both arms, and they quit letting him play football after that because he was just he was just too adamant about it. He just put too much into it, and he would hurt himself. But he was good at track, so that's where he got his letter. Upon graduation, he chose the cavalry because he thought it would be an exciting way to go into the army. After graduating and becoming cavalry officer, he met a young lady, or actually he had met this young lady way back when she was just about a little 12 or 13 year old girl. Uh, the Ayer family had property back in California. He had met Beatrice when she was just a child and almost instantly fell in love with her and it kind of bothered him for the rest of his life because he knew that when she grew up even though of course you can't marry someone when they're 12 or 13 but he knew that there was something special about this girl and all through his career at West Point she kept coming down to visit him and after they finally got married then they started their own family her father was against the marriage because he didn't like the idea of a man being in the military. He didn't like the idea of a soldier being married to his daughter. So Patton wrote a letter to his father, to her father one day, and explained to him that he could not explain why, but for some reason it was just as natural for him to be a soldier as anything else. And if he couldn't be a soldier, then he had no reason to live. Therefore, that was what he wanted to do, and that was what he wanted to be and her father acquiesced and then they got married in and uh, later on in 1912 Patton attended the Olympics held at Stockholm Sweden that was the same year that Jim Thorpe was given all the medals Patton competed in the modern pentathlon the military pentathlon they called it then and the events included pistol shooting a 300 meter swim fencing a steeplechase and a cross-country foot race he finished a very respectable fifth place. What was interesting was during the trials for the pistol shooting, he had set a record. Yet whenever they actually had the day of competition, they said that he had missed one of the targets. Now the story goes that actually when they looked at the target, his, his pattern of shots was so close that very probably one of the bullets went through one of the other holes or close to it and they couldn't discern that there was another hole missing there. So that's the problem. They couldn't see all of the holes so they assumed that he had missed even though he had set a record just the previous day for his shooting. And that pushed him down so otherwise had he not uh, gotten that he would have won. He would have gotten a gold medal for the Olympics for that year. After the games, and at his own expense, Patton and his wife traveled to the French Cavalry School located in Sommer, France. He was going to take lessons from the fencing instructor there. While they were also there, Beatrice was not only fluent in French, she wrote and uh, read French extremely well, of course. And what she did was she helped him to take the French manuals and take the parts that he wanted and then uh, rewrite them into English so that later when he got back to the States, he wrote the entire uh, manual for swordsmanship and for cavalry for using swords in the U.S. Army. He then purposefully cultivated his own reputation as a swordsman, and he later designed a saber that the United States cavalry adopted. It was called the M1913 Saber. So actually what happened at this point was he got one of his first nicknames. He had a number of nicknames long before he had the blood and guts nickname that someone had erroneously given him during the Second World War. Some reporter had misheard or apparently didn't like the fact that Patton had simply said it takes blood and brains to win a war. And he, whoever that reporter was, uh, changed it around and called it blood and guts. So that's what stuck. But before that, 
At the time that Patton had created his M1913 Sabre, he was then called Sabre Jarge. And that was an interesting thing for a very young second lieutenant in the Army to have a great distinction like that. The Sabre itself was an interesting idea. It showed exactly what his whole concept was and would remain to be his concept through the entire history and career of his Army days. What he wanted to do was teach men, instead of taking the curved saber they had before and trying to hack men to death, you would take the saber, hold it in your arm, extend your arm, lay down on your horse's neck at a full gallop, and then as a full, complete weapon, you, your horse, and your saber fully extended and pointed whenever you hit your opponent, that was pretty much it. Your opponent was dead. There was no question about it. And as he would tell his men, says, don't worry about whether or not you're going to disengage with the enemy. You just, as you go forward, you'll automatically bring your hand down and the sword designed with the rivulets, the blood rivulets on both sides, it will automatically disengage and pull from the enemy. Therefore, you can go on and get the next man in line. And that was his whole concept. Straightforward, direct. That was the way that you won battles. When he was assigned to the cavalry school at Fort Riley, Kansas, he then took over the instruction of the cavalry course. He instructed his men both in the use of the new saber he designed, and he instructed them in horsemanship too. At this time he was given an impressive title that was called the Master of the Sword. He was the very first to hold the newly created title. It was quite a bit for a, a young second lieutenant. In March of 1916, Pancho Villa raided the town of Columbus, New Mexico. They killed a total of 17 American citizens. They had actually crossed the border. They had committed an act of war. And then sometimes people today wonder why Americans went down to Mexico. They forget the fact that they had committed an act of war. In response to the raid, General John J. Pershing, called Blackjack Pershing, organized a punitive expedition to pursue Villa into Mexico. It is said at the time that uh, Pershing had already put together his staff and they were getting ready to go and when Patton heard about it he wanted to know why he couldn't go along so what he did was he just simply camped out on General Pershing's doorstep and every single time the general would come or go he would see Patton and Patton would stand and salute and say sir requesting permission to go and finally Pershing realized, well, I guess if he wants to go that bad, he may have some good attributes about him. During May, Patton was in charge of a 15-man contingent traveling in three Dodge Touring Cars. The purpose for the trip was to buy corn from Mexican farmers for the American soldiers. Patton supposedly was relying purely on a hunch. And what he did then, he led a little raid at a place called the Rubio Ranch. He believed that one of Villa's men might be there. As it turned out, not one, but three of the enemy were actually there. And during the, their attempted escape, Patton and his men engaged them in a lively skirmish. All three of the bandits were killed. Patton personally was responsible for dispatching two of them. And that's why on his Colt 45 with the ivory handles, not pearl handles, on his Colt 45 he put two notches. He had personally, as a soldier, dispatched two enemy. He had killed two men with that gun. That gun, if you ever want to see it by the way, is on display with the other gun that he carried, the Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum. They're both on display at the Patton Museum at Fort Knox, Kentucky. It's a wonderful museum, beautiful place. After the bandits had been taken care of, Patton triumphantly strapped the bodies onto the motor cars, one on each hood. He then took them directly to Pershing's headquarters for identification. He created quite a commotion there. He had gone in and broken up a meeting that Pershing was having, and Pershing was really not very happy because he didn't like people coming in and interrupting him when he was doing something. But Patton said, sir, if you please come outside here, you'll see why I'm bothering you. And then when Pershing walked out and saw the three bandits strapped on there like, like dead deer that had been shot as trophies, <clears throat> then he realized what he had on his hands there. 
and it was interesting too because Lieutenant Patton immediately became a national hero. This was one of the things that kind of uh, started his desire for fame, I suppose, because he had become a national hero. Newspapers in the United States had carried stories about his exploits, and for a full week he had his picture in the papers all over the United States. Stories were mentioned where his name was prominent all over the United States, and it was quite an interesting time for the young man. If you look back in history, there are certain things that happen at certain times, and you don't really realize what they are at the time until you get past. That's something that General Patton had always tried to instill in his men. Especially when you look back into Mexico, you realize that General Patton, as a lieutenant, was actually involved in the very first motorized engagement in history. He had taken motorized uh, warfare to the enemy and he had dispatched the enemy and then he had with motorization he had taken the, the bodies back of course and showed Pershing. One of the problems that Patton had in Mexico was that there really wasn't much to do other than the fact that they had the firefight and he became a national hero for a period of time. Uh, Mexico duty was really pretty rough. It was hot, it was dirty, um, it was boring, it was monotonous, but Patton being Patton, he always wanted to make the best of every situation. So what he did in his off hours, he, he always studied General Pershing. And what he did in the past, in the next few years, he started to try to take the better qualities of Pershing and put them into his personality, yet retain his personality and his focus for combat. When Pershing assumed command of the American Expeditionary Force going to France in World War I, because he had known Patton and he had known what he had done, he took Patton with him, of course. Now the problem again was, Patton was stuck in the headquarters office with Pershing, and it was a boring, tiresome office job. At that time, a fellow by the name of Swinton, who was an Englishman, he created what was called a tank. And the tank, and the whole concept of tank warfare, became a very interesting concept to General Patton. He realized if this were done correctly, then we could take this tank and we could actually use our cavalry tactics for speed and boldness and put it into the tank core and then we could really make something out of this. He knew that the tanks were not only new, they were also unreliable, they were unwieldy, and they were unproven instruments of warfare, but he knew that if you did it right, if you could take these tanks and really come up with a good tactic, a good concept, and use them correctly, then they would be something special. Patton was then assigned as the very first officer to the United States Tank Corps. Why he was not given co complete control of it, I don't know, but uh, at the time he was only a colonel, and of course, the, as always, they wanted a general in charge of something, so they found a general and put him in charge of it and put Patton under him. But Patton was actually the one who ran the tank corps. Patton almost single-handedly formed the American Tank School. He wrote the training manuals. He devised the training doctrine and methodologies. He wrote the seminal paper which became the basis for the United States Tank Corps. He taught and trained his tankers and he eventually led them into combat. The paper that he wrote, as a matter of fact, I have a copy of it and on the very front of the paper he, in his own handwriting, wrote down that this is the best technical paper I ever wrote and it was in fact the basis for the entire United States Tank Corps. On the first day of the Meuse-Argonne offensive, Patton was very nearly killed. A bullet struck him in the upper leg, passed completely through him, and on its exit it ripped out a large piece of flesh from his buttock. Uh, it tore a large hole in the rear of his lower cheek. But Patton again, being Patton, in spite of his profuse bleeding, he kept advancing until the loss of blood forced him to stop. He was then luckily evacuated to a rear echelon hospital before he bled to death on the battlefield. It was the final combat that he would see during World War I. 
and unfortunately as a birthday present the armistice was signed on his birthday November 11th which eventually became Veterans Day. Patton used to always joke about his wound and very often during parties if he had had a little too much to drink he was more than happy to drop his drawers and show people where the wound was and very often of course what he would do he would do it just simply to get a rise out of people he wanted to see how people would react to some of the things he would say and some of the things he would do when he would do that he would drop his drawers he would show people his wound and then he would brag about being a half-assed general after the armistice was signed, Patton returned to the United States as an officer of the Tank Corps. But shortly after that, because the Tank Corps was being uh, pretty much ignored by Congress, they had no money, uh, he returned to the cavalry because the cavalry was his first love. The major reason, of course, for his departure from the Tank Corps was the stinginess of the United States Congress, which is a continual thing. If you look at what's happened after World War I, after World War II, after Korea, after almost every war we've been involved in, they think that that's the end of it, and then they cut back and they destroy the military. But anyway, after Congress allotted a total of $500 for a full year's worth of research and development for the tank corps, Patton realized that during the years of peace there would be no American development of the tank, and he was absolutely correct. It was other people who would develop the tank. In the early 1930s, Patton did not remain static, of course. While he was stationed at Pearl Harbor, he wrote a very highly prophetic discussion paper. Its subject matter dealt with the possibility of an air attack by the Japanese against the Hawaiian Islands. Patton held the firm opinion that Japan had explicit and definite ideas about domination of the Pacific Basin. His paper outlined almost exactly the plan that was used by the Japanese on December 7, 1941. He had written the paper, he had given it to the G2 intelligence officer, and apparently it had been just stuffed away somewhere, filed, and never looked at. In 1939, of course, things begin to happen. Hitler had taken over Germany, the Sudetenland had been taken, Austria had been taken. By 1939, Poland was in distress. Patton was then assigned to the 2nd Armored Brigade, stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. His skillful management of the 2nd Brigade soon prompted his being given command of the entire 2nd, 2nd Armored Division. He was soon considered to be, again, America's leading tank expert. It was the second time that he had had to prove himself for this but he did it, as always. In 1942, General Patton was assigned the task of creating the Desert Training Center, called the DTC, in the Mojave Desert. The Desert Training Center incorporated most of the Mojave Desert, and it was everywhere between perhaps the southern middle, uh, southern middle half of California, all the way through Arizona, up into uh, Nevada. Actually, the whole Desert Training Center, the area in mileage alone, acreage, was larger than Uni the United Kingdom, Great Britain. But General Patton was out there, and he figured that what I'm going to do is, since we're going to invade North Africa, our men had better know what it's like to be in the desert. So he went to the desert and he trained his men. At best, it was about 115 or 120 degrees outside the tanks, so you can imagine what it was like inside the tanks. The men were given a gallon of water a day, and they were told you can shave with it, you can drink it, you can do whatever you want to with it, but that's all you're getting. And he spent a lot of his time out at the DTC creating the U.S. tank doctrine and tactics that were going to be used in North Africa. And by the time they got ready, and by the time they were overseas and at North Africa, they were glad to be in North Africa. Thing, it was easier there than it was under Patton at the DTC. 
There were rattlesnakes, there were scorpions, it was hot, it was dusty, it was pretty nasty weather. If you want to see a little history about the Desert Training Center, if you go to Indio, California, or if you're in Indio, California, and you head due east on Highway 10, about 35 miles later, and you can't miss it if there's nothing else there, there is a place called the General Patton Memorial Museum. Very often people will ask, well, why in the world did they put a Patton Museum out there? And that's exactly the reason, because General Patton was the one who created the Desert Training Center, and that is where Camp Young was located. Camp Young, of course, was the headquarters for the entire Desert Training Center. After General Patton left, General Walton Walker had taken over command of the area, and after he had trained his men, took them over to England, and then onto the continent, he became the commanding general of the 20th Corps, which was under Patton's Third Army. And General Walton Walker's men were also called the Ghost Corps, the 20th Corps, which also spearheaded the entire Third Army during the Second World War. So there's a lot of history out there at that museum. In the spring of 1943, after the disastrous American defeat at Kasserin Pass in Tunisia, Patton was given command of the Second Corps. In customary Patton fashion, he not only took command, he grabbed it by the throat. He let people know exactly what was going on and who was in charge. Patton quickly straightened out the disorganized American units, led them to victory at El Qatar, and then turned over command of the Corps to his deputy commander, Omar Bradley. As commanding general of the Seventh Army, General Patton and his soldiers stole the glory that General Montgomery so badly wanted. Hampered by higher echelon, sparse supplies, and forced to use secondary roads, in spite of all that, Patton and the Seventh Army still managed to reach Messina first. Now this is something in the movie that you'll notice that they have Patton and all of his men and the tanks and everything there. In fact, that's not really true. Uh, they did beat them to Messina, but they got there just a little bit before, maybe a, a few hours before. The slapping incidents. <laughs> Every time I think about this, I just think how silly it is. When they were at the front, if a man turned tail and ran, that's one of the reasons why officers had 45s on them. Men were actually shot at the front because of cowardice. Nobody asked questions. Yet one man slaps a couple of soldiers, and they almost ruin his career over that. Which is interesting because the Russians certainly would never care about that. And the Germans just absolutely could not believe that just because a general was a little upset and he got a little emotional and he struck someone that they would actually take him out of combat because of that. At any rate, there were two men slapped, not just one. And it's interesting to note that during the slapping incidents, one of the men believe it or not, had left his unit without permission. He had gone on sick call without permission. He was, in fact, AWOL at the time. No one knew where he was. He was just sitting there waiting for someone to ask him what his problem was. And that's one of the men that, unfortunately, Patton came in contact with. So, the fact of the matter is, because the man was AWOL, they could have court-martialed him, they could have stood him up and shot him as a deserter, but that never came to light. The other man had had major problems, he had run away a number of times anyhow, and Patton never really, if we want to get technical, like they get technical in the courtrooms today, Patton never really did slap them in. He struck them with his gloves. He personally never came into contact with them. But both of these guys who were slapped, they were what he called malingerers. Now let's back up here just a second and also give you a little background on General Patton. General Patton had been receiving reports that some of the men, upon landing in Sicily, had been taking off their uniforms and throwing them away, getting clothes from some of the locals and trying to act like they were part of the inhabitants of the island. 
he was getting reports which may sound humorous on the front but really is not very humorous that back in the old days the US Army used to manufacture their own soap now an interesting thing about the soap was if you cut off a sliver of it and forced it up your rectal cavity for some strange reason it would not hurt you not affect you anything in any way other than it would raise your temperature of your body to about 102 103 degrees so men were doing that and then going on sick call to get out of combat duty Patton himself was suffering from the flu he was running without <laughs> without the uh, assistance of any soap he was actually running a fever of about 103 he was working 16 hour days he was trying to change things around so that the American army was not something that was just there to help out the British army and Montgomery but they were their own force and getting their own headlines and during all of this he walks into a place where he sees men who have been blinded men who have their hands gone men who are dying men who have half a head left men with blood all over them and then he walks up to this other man and he says what are you here for and the guy says I just can't take it Patton was Patton everybody knew the way George Patton was everybody knew how George Patton acted and reacted why was it such a big surprise when he acted the way he did he hauled off and slapped the guy with his gloves actually both of them he did he had given orders previously that these malingerers as he called them these so-called shell-shocked soldiers were not to be allowed in these areas where men were wounded he had given specific and direct orders they were to be kept separate and apart from everyone else those orders were not followed one of the commanding officers who was a doctor in charge of the hospitals over there was actually a reserve officer and he had a great dislike for Patton in the first place he personally didn't care whether that order was followed or not he could have been court-martialed for not following that specific order and then what happens is the man in charge I think it was a uh, Colonel Bless was his name he wrote up a report on this chastising Patton he sent the report off and of course it went through the normal echelons and it ended up with General Bradley General Bradley didn't even bother to show this report to General Patton so he could see what was happening and he could be aware that someone uh, was actually reporting this he locked it away in his safe so Patton was unaware that this report had been filed then after it all broke loose the only reason it really came to fruition was because of Drew Pearson the people or some people rather not to like make a blanket statement some people in the United States and especially the newspaper community decided to believe this so-called muckraker instead of believing what was really going on over in Sicily and at the time too to add to the problems General Patton here he was fighting for so-called freedom yet he was given a direct order by General Eisenhower to shut up he was not allowed to talk about it he was not allowed to explain it he was not allowed to do anything he was just simply told to dummy up and sit back and that was it he couldn't even talk then he didn't even have the right to free speech the only thing that happened was Patton was chastised he was made to apologize and even when he went out on, out on these apologies very often the units didn't want to hear them he would stand up in front of for example the third division and the third division wouldn't hear it he started to apologize and they started shouting him down they said we don't want to hear it we don't want to hear it because they knew what kind of a man General Patton really was and uh, in at the end of every chapter of my book the unknown Patton I have a little piece from uh, the Associated Press or some newspaper clipping about General Patton and one of them is titled soldier says Patton can kick slap or slug him anytime 
And he goes on to say in there that he knows General Patton is the damnedest best fighter there is. And as far as he's concerned, Patton can come over and slap him anytime he wants because he knows that Patton is the best damn general there is. And he knows that he's going to get him home safe and he's going to get him home as fast as he possibly can. So much for the slapping incidents. In the spring of 1944, Patton sailed to England on the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary was built by the Cunard White Star Company, was pressed into military service as a troop transport for most of World War II. It was called the Gray Ghost because they had to repaint it gray and then they would slip through the they would go the northern route so they would catch a lot of fog and that way they could transport a lot of people at the at one time. Once disembarked on the continent, Patton and Third Army, or what he called Lucky Forward as their code name, Patton always believed in luck. He he told his men that when you're born, it's just like being dealt a hand. You're dealt so much luck, and you either use it up or you don't. If you don't go out and test it, you'll never use it up. If you do go out and test it, then you'll use up what you have, and when you run out, well, then you're out of luck, and that's too bad. That's the way it's meant to be. That's fate. After the Third Army had finally landed on and started out officially on the 1st of August, 1944, they attacked again like the old cavalrymen with uh, three arms. They attacked in all directions. They drove south, west, east, north, across France. They destroyed everything in their path that was German. They came back up around and uh, stopped at Falais waiting for the British under Montgomery to close the Argentan Falais gap, which he never closed until the German 7th Army managed to escape the bulk of the army. Had they allowed Patton to close that, they could have had the whole entire army cut off. They could have destroyed that whole army right then and there. Very possibly it could have cut off the war by another three or four months. You never know. In December 1944, the Germans launched what they call the Ardennes Offensive. The Americans called it the Battle of the Bulge. Patton's army made a spectacular battle march to relieve the 101st Airborne's Screaming Eagles who were holding Bastogne against all odds. Interesting story about that. When Patton was over there and they knew that something was going on because every single time that the Germans had radio silence it meant that there was going to be some major operation coming into effect. Well, the Germans had radio silence. General Patton's G2 his intelligence officer, Oscar Koch, Colonel Koch, was probably one of the best, if not the best, intelligence officer in all of the Army at that time. He had made certain specific reports about the area. He had told General Patton about the situation. He had sent a number of communiques to Schaaf headquarters warning Eisenhower that there was something happening in that area. And one of the reasons it was happening is because the First Army incorrectly according to military maxims they had made a rest and recuperation area too close to the front they were letting their men just simply sit around and do nothing and the Germans knew it and General uh, Patton and Koch got together the reports they sent them to Schaefer. they kept telling them there's something going on here you better pay attention up there around Luxembourg around the, uh, the Bastogne area and no one paid attention of course and then on the 16th of December all hell broke loose the Germans came through and if it had not been for General Patton they damn well could have gotten into Antwerp because the Germans were the Americans were just simply unprepared for the Germans of course Patton as always made the best of the situation and he was probably one of the few people who really like a chess player, instead of simply looking at your current move to play chess properly, you have to look at the board and you have to consider, if I do this, what's he going to do over there? And if I do that, what's he going to do over there? So what he and Koch did was to sit down with the staff and they came up with two completely separate, distinct plans. And when Patton went to the meeting with General Eisenhower and Bradley, 
Patton stood up and everyone else was pretty much down in the dumps and Patton was the only one there somewhat jub jubilant and had a good positive attitude about this. He stood up and said, well, I, if you let me go, I can have uh, a couple of divisions going in uh, 48 hours. And Ike gave him one of his stares, like he used to say, a stare. And uh, he said, George, don't be fatuous. This is a very serious situation. And Patton said, don't you worry about it. When we left, everything was in order at my house. I have two complete separate plans ready to go. And then he walked up to the map and he showed exactly with about a half an hour's presentation both plans and what he really wanted to do was let the Germans go ahead for another day or two and get the bulk of their, of their forces beyond the shoulders of the American and, uh, and allied armies and then just chop them off right at the head the same way they could have done with the German 7th Army and pretty much ended the war another two or three months earlier which again then would have kept the Russians from getting into Berlin and taking most of Germany and eating up half of Europe but those things don't fit into some of these people's minds or as General Patton would say that's not the way these gentlemen up north fight war so anyway Patton's standing up there at the map and he's going through this and everyone is just flabbergasted that Patton has such a complete, absolute, total control of the situation and he knows what's going on. So Eisenhower says, well, that sounds okay to me. Go ahead and do it. And within 24 hours, Patton had about 90% of his army turned 90 degrees heading the other way north, which if you look at what goes on within an army, just getting anything to happen at all very often is a major, major thing that takes weeks. But, of course, we're talking about Georgie Patton here. Now, George Patton, by God, he wasn't about to let anybody stop him from doing that because he knew that this was his personal prime moment of time. This was the epitome of his career, to stand up in front of all the people who looked down upon him and who, and who were promoted above him purely for political reasons, and then show them that he, in fact, was the better man. He was the better general. He was the one who should have been running the show. And, of course, that's the way it went. They uh, went into Bastogne. They pushed back the bulge. Instead of cutting it off like Patton wanted to, Eisenhower had this big thing about pushing them back on a broad front. Now, when you push back on a broad front, though, if you study tactics at all, anyone with a basic concept of tactics will know that what you need to do is envelopments. A series of small envelopments then become a series of large envelopments. And that's the way you cut off the enemy, or what Patton used to say, you hold them by the nose and you kick them in the ass. In the spring of 1945, after this was all over, Patton's army drove relentlessly into Germany across the Rhine finally down into Austria and at the war's end his soldiers were in Czechoslovakia and getting ready to go further. Patton and his warriors had given a magnificent performance. Third Army had in fact gone farther, faster, they had conquered more territory, they had killed, wounded, and captured more enemy soldiers than any other army in the entire recorded history of war. And then in December 1945, it was at the end of Patton's luck. December 12th, General Patton was driving along in his 1939 Cadillac. Woody Woodring was driving, and Hobart Gay, his chief of staff and his buddy, were sitting in the back. And General Patton had just reached over to open up his shotgun case because they were going out pheasant hunting. He had reached over to to open up a shotgun case to look at something inside and a two and a half ton truck driven by two guys who had gone out previously the night before gotten drunk and were still hung over made an illegal left turn into the Kasern at Mannheim, Germany. They cut right straight in front of Patton's car. Woody Woodring could not get out of the way and they smashed into the car. Patton flew forward since he was leaning forward. He hit his head on the front of front seat of the car. Well, some people say the front seat, some people say the car actually 
kind of jumped up a bit because of the fact it hit and of course the momentum on a vehicle will keep it going forward and some people say that he hit the uh, the light on the, the overhead inside the car but at any rate it's it cut his scalp open lacerated his scalp pulled the scalp back about halfway snapped his head back and broke the vertebrae in his neck he was paralyzed at that time and he never came out of paralysis they took him into the hospital they brought in a specialist and the specialist told him right up front he said that your neck has been snapped your vertebrae is broken you'll probably remain paralyzed the rest of your life you will never walk you will never ride a horse again and then they started doing things to him to at least try to relieve some of the pain and pressure they took large fish hooks and these large fish hooks they inserted under the bones, the cheekbones of Patton, they inserted them under the bones underneath, uh, near the base of his neck, underneath his skull, and they put weights on those to try to pull his head back. Luckily, his wife was able to make it over there, and she spent some time with him. And then the end came. He started to do pretty well, but the end came later whenever he said to her says it's getting too dark I mean too late and then he went to sleep she went off to have lunch and when she came back he was dead and General Patton died at five minutes before 6 p.m. on December 21st his body was put on display in Heidelberg in the church he was put on a train and he was taken to the American Military Cemetery at Ham, Luxembourg and he was buried among his men. People often ask, well, why was he buried over there? Why wasn't he brought back home like all officers? General Walker had mentioned to Beatrice that, you know, George always said he wanted to be with his men. So she said, well, of course, that's the simple answer. That's where he should be. So they decided that he would be buried with his men, and to this day he's the only American general officer buried in a foreign country. Where he was buried among the other 4,000 graves which still exist there at that cemetery, graves of men who apparently uh, were single or men who just simply didn't have anyone because they were never claimed, their bodies were never claimed, or there was no one to report their deaths to. They're still over there in the foreign country, buried in the country where they fought for the freedom, for the people, for that country. General Patton was buried among the men, but after years went by, so many people started coming by to visit the grave site that they were actually wearing down all of the grass around the other graves. So they dug Patton up and they moved him toward the head of the cemetery. And now he has his own special place up there. And he is still visited to this day. Yeah. General Patton went to the Virginia Mil Military Institute. And now at VMI, he only spent one year there. And the reason he only spent one year there was because his father was in the background and he was working feverishly with the California senators and representatives trying to secure a place for George Patton at West Point. And it took him about a year to do so. But finally, when it happened, he had spent a year at VMI, so he knew what it was like to be a plebe. Actually, Patton probably had about three years of being a plebe, which is pretty rough. He was at West Point. Uh, he was at VMI for a year, and then he went to West Point, and the first year as a plebe was really rough for him. He had a lot of trouble getting into the track, and because of his reading disabilities, he had major problems there, too. Yet, the interesting thing about all this is that he persevered, no matter what. He knew that he had to do this, so he kept up until he did it. After the year was over, he had failed his mathematics exam by one-tenth of one percent. Now why this is I don't know and I've never been able to track it down but there is the story that for some reason if you failed a certain exam then for some other reason you had to take another exam. 
and although he had previously passed his French exams, he had to take them again because he had failed the other exams. So he went back for the French exams, and he again failed that one by just about a tenth of a percent. And they were going to kick him out. But he went forward and he asked them for special permission, and because he was such a military-type individual, they decided to give him a second chance. So the following year, he came back to West Point again as a plebe. Now you can imagine that now you're at West Point and all of the people who you were with the previous year are one grade ahead of you. And all the people you're with this year know that. So you have to work even harder. So anyway, it took him about five years to get through West Point. But once he got through, then he did graduate and he was West Pointer and he was on his way. After West Point, at which he graduated 46th in the class of 103, which isn't too bad for a person with dyslexia. He had actually held the rank of cadet corporal, sergeant major, and the adjutant of his class. He won his school... Hello, my name is Charles M. Province. My friends call me Mike. I am the founder and president of the General George S. Patton, Jr. Historical Society. The society was begun in 1970. The initial purpose when I started the society was simply to honor the man who, in my honest opinion, never did receive a great amount of attention at the time that he really wanted it. Yes, I know everybody said he was a megalomaniac and he was a prima donna, but in fact, he probably deserved all of that because he was such a great man. He was not just a general. At any other point in time, three or four or five hundred years back in history, he would probably have been one of the great men in all of history. Patton was a man of rather contradictory characteristics, as a matter of fact. He was a noted horseman, a polo player. He was a well-known champion swordsman. He was even in the 1912 Olympics, and during the Olympics he had given the French champion the only defeat that he had received. He was a competent sailor, a sportsman. He was an amateur poet. Uh, some years ago, there was a fellow who came out with a book uh, just specifically on Patton and his poetry. He was unpredictable in his actions, but he was always dependable. You knew that he was going to do what he was told to do, and he would do it right. He was outgoing, yet at times he was introverted. History proves him to be one of the most complex and possibly paradoxical figures ever to exist. He's mostly remembered for his unique brand of leadership. It was a role that he cultivated and fully exercised. Very often his daughters would catch him in the bathroom in front of the mirror and he would be giving strange faces to himself and they would say, Daddy, what are you doing? And he'd say, I'm practicing my war face. So when I go to war, I want those sons of bitches to be scared of me, by God. He managed to obtain a supreme effort from his men because he knew what it was like to be in battle. He knew what it was like to be in danger. He was scared himself, and he knew that going into battle was one of the most frightening things you could do. Not only are you in a foreign country, not only are you possibly tired and hungry, you haven't had sleep, and people are trying to shoot you too. He had had the same problems in World War I. He had been in a dip letter by breaking a school record in the hurdles event. He had tried to break records and to play football and baseball, but when he was playing football, he broke his nose twice. He broke both arms, and they quit letting him play football after that because he was just, he was just too adamant about it. He just put too much into it, and he would hurt himself. But he was good at track, so that's where he got his letter. Upon graduation, he chose the cavalry because he thought it would be an exciting way to go into the Army. After graduating and becoming a cavalry officer, he met a young lady, or actually he had met this young lady way back when she was just about a little 12 or 13 year old girl. Uh, the Ayer family had property back in California. He had met Beatrice when she was just a child and almost instantly fell in love with her and it kind of bothered him for the rest of his life because he knew that when she grew up even though of course you can't marry someone when they're 12 or 13 but he knew that there was something special about this girl 
and all through his career at West Point she kept coming down to visit him and after they finally got married then they started their own family. Her father was against the marriage because he didn't like the idea of a man being in the military. He didn't like the idea of a soldier being married to his daughter. So Patton wrote a letter to his father to her father one day and explained to him that he could not explain why but for some reason it was just as natural for him to be a soldier as anything else and if he couldn't be a soldier then he had no reason to live. Therefore that was what he wanted to do and that was what he wanted to be. And her father acquiesced and then they got married in and uh, later on in 1912 Patton attended the Olympics held at Stockholm Sweden that was the same year that Jim Thorpe was given all the medals Patton competed in the modern pentathlon the military pentathlon they called it then and the events included pistol shooting a 300 meter swim fencing a steeplechase and a cross-country foot race he finished a very respectable fifth place what was interesting was during the trials for the pistol shooting he had set and he just happened to look up into the sky and in the clouds he thought that he had seen or he said he had seen whichever way you want to take it he said he had seen the figures of his forebears and they were looking down on him and they were shamefully looking at him saying Georgie Georgie there you are lying down in that ditch and you're going to die like a cowardly son of a bitch why don't you get up and at least die like a brave man? And he said he stopped shaking and he shook it off and that was it and then he went on and of course he won the battle that day. And that's what it's all about. It's not necessarily being afraid in battle, it's being able to control your fear. And that's what life is all about. Life from the time you're born until the time you die. Life is just one constant battle. And if you give in, then you're lost. If you give in to the fear, then you're lost. What you have to do is constantly stand up and fight back. All of this pretty much was built into him a little bit earlier. Benjamin Davis Wilson was General Patton's great-grandfather. Benjamin Davis Wilson was also called by the Mexicans in early California, Don Benito. Benjamin Davis Wilson was a trapper who had left Tennessee, worked his way over to California. He was a mountain man, he was a trapper, he had uh, fought bears and all sorts of things. It was, if you look at some of the old stories about Davy Crockett, well Benjamin Davis Wilson was the type of Davy Crockett, if not more so. It was he, not President Wilson, after whom Mount Wilson in California was named, it was Benjamin Davis Wilson who actually created the citrus industry, the orange industry in California. He built the Episcopal Church of Our Savior in San Gabriel before it was San Gabriel. It was the same church where George S. Patton, after being born, was taken in and baptized. The same church where today there is a stained glass window to honor General George S. Patton. There is a eight foot or nine foot bronze statue of General George S. Patton. Also in the graveyard next to the church, there's the monument to Don Benito Wilson. There's also the graves of General Patton's father, George Patton, his mother, and his aunt, and his sister. George Patton was actually called George Patton Jr., but in fact he was the third in the line. But because of the Civil War and things that happened there, there was a break in the line, so he was called the second, or the junior. The Pattons actually uh, regard themselves, regarded themselves as genteel Virginians. Their lineage, they say, was traced back to George Washington and beyond that to a king of England and a king of France. Reportedly, the Pattons were supposed to have had at least 16 signers of the England's Magna Carta that were somehow related to them. After the Civil War, George's father, being a young man, realized that there was very little, if anything, left for them down there. So he packed up and moved to California. And when he moved to California, he met the daughter of Don Benito Wilson, Benjamin Davis Wilson. And they got married, and their son was George S. Patton, Jr. And from that time on, the father taught the son how to ride, 
taught him how to fish, taught him how to do everything that a man should know how to do. And he learned how to be a man. One of the problems, again, like I said, was uh, General Patton, they think now, suffered from dyslexia. And because of that fact, General Patton didn't go to school until he was about 11 or 12 years old. He stayed at home, and his father and mother read to him. They read from the Bible. They read from the classics. They read from uh, Virgil and uh, Homer and all of the great cla classics about history and Greek warfare and Spartans and all sorts of things like that. And what happened was, all of this stuck in his head. And then when he did go to school at Stephen Cutter Clark School, which was in Pasadena at the time, it was quite interesting to see this young man, about 12 years old, standing up in front of the class who could neither read nor write, even though his classmates could read or write, yet he could stand up there and he could spout volumes from the Bible. He could spout volumes from uh, Virgil. He could spout volumes from Shakespeare. He would do it with great dramatic flair too. Even at 12 years old he was quite the actor. After going to Pasadena